Uh, let me welcome you for a joint event that's co-sponsored by the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies and the Ford School of Public Policy together with the International Policy Center. It's one of our uh, distinguished university-wide lectures and uh, it is a pleasure today to introduce a distinguished speaker and a dear friend, Leszek Balcerowicz, who, as you can see, is currently professor of uh, economics at the Warsaw School of Economics and also visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. He has a very rich and distinguished career. I would say he's probably the most influential policymaker in uh, Central and East Europe in the transition economies over the last uh, 20 plus years. Uh, he served as the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Uh, he prepared the first plan of transition that was implemented uh, in the transition economies, uh, widely discussed, followed, debated. And he also served as Governor of the Central Bank. Uh, since then, he's been on uh, the boards of various uh, institutions, both advisory boards, executive boards, and is one of the founding members of uh, one of the most successful think tanks, CASE think tank in Poland, where I have the pleasure to serve on the uh, advisory board. So uh, Leszek, as you can see, has selected a narrow topic today, uh, well, very well defined. And um, so um, I'm looking forward to his talk. He will um, speak for um, 40, 45 minutes forever, then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So please prepare your questions. We have microphones, and it would be nice if you step to the microphones afterward, Let's introduce yourself and uh, ask the question. So, Leszek, welcome. Thank you very much, Jan. I realize this is a rather big and moving topic moving target, uh, and Europe is diverse. Nevertheless, and my agenda is pre pretty ambitious, but I will take no more than 40 minutes of your time because uh, question and answer session, the debate is always most interesting. And the first points are just an introduction to remind you, longer run. <clears throat> then you realize that uh, in the 19th century, the difference in per capita income between the West including Western Europe and China and India was much smaller than later. And the whole divergence between China, India, and the West has taken place between the uh, beginning of 19th century and 1950. We have more exact data, but when we move to, this was per capita, when we move to aggregate GDP, you see that until 1950, <coughs> China was stagnating. So for 150 years, more the same goes more or less for India. And then it was a surge. The surge started in 1970. And if you extrapolate, which you, you should not do, then it's easier to see <laughs> when China <laughs> overtakes the United States. Another thing is that if you look at the data, then you see that in 19th century, 1850, the GDP, estimated GDP of China was larger than of the US because of a very simple fact that China has many more people. And the relative position of Europe depends on the rate of growth of China, India on the one hand, on the other hand on the US. Regarding the gap between the US and the largest European countries, uh, uh, Britain, Germany, France, it's uh, interesting that there was a convergence after the Second World War. So Western Europe was catching up until more or less 80s, and then there was a divergence. So the United States started to grow faster than Western Europe. So gap has been growing, and there's an interesting debate why. One of the reasons is demography. Another one is that on the whole European who work less than the US. Okay, now, but this was focused on Western Europe. But Europe is not only Western Europe. Many people forget. <laughs> <laughs> Europe is Southern Europe, Southeastern, Central Europe. And it's worth looking what has happened within Europe regarding the rate of growth, relative rate of growth. Now, to cut it short, <clears throat> after the Second World War, until the 90s, early 90s, Southern Europe, meaning uh, Greece, Portugal, Spain, 
to some extent, was catching up upon the Western Europe. So Greece was growing pretty reasonably. <laughs> but East Central Europe, represented here by former Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland, was diverging, meaning simply that socialism was very bad for growth. Neither freedom nor development. <laughs> OK, now what has happened between 1994 and 2007? So before the present crisis and after what people call transformational recession in central former socialist countries. You see, I have divided European countries into two groups. The first one is called developed Europe, and the one is emerging Europe. First thing is striking variation within those groups. So you see that, can you see that Italy was growing, but also Germany was growing quite slowly during that period. What country was a tiger? Ireland. And it was a genuine tiger. It is not true that uh, the bust, the boom and bust, uh, has invalidated previous achievement. There were previous achievements in Ireland. And I am sure uh, Ireland will overcome the problems. Within uh, Central and Eastern Europe, you see equally striking variation. Well, Ukraine, unfortunately, has not been diverging. This is the average for the whole period. So if you look at later years, you would see some acceleration. But look at the Baltics, what uh, Slovakia, Poland. These are countries which have been converging on, uh, uh, on, the, on Western Europe within the whole, whole group. If you look at the whole period, uh, starting with 1989 or 90 until the present day, that you see that the country which has converged more, I'm very happy to say, is Poland. Why? This brings me to the second issue. What explains? That's a huge different <laughs> topic. What explains the differences in the long-term economic growth? <laughs> Millions of pages have been written. And I try to summarize in one page. And this is this. <clears throat> If you look at the experience, you see two kinds of forces. I, the first one I call systematic in the sense they operate all the time, even with different intensity. And these systematic forces are considered at two levels. The approximate level which prevails in the literature, it's productivity growth, employment, and capital. And this is the forecast of conventional growth theory, which is easy to use mathematics in but it's not deep enough. Because it's easy to say, well, productivity has been growing slowly under socialism in Europe than under some capitalistic economies elsewhere, but the question is why? Why? It's easy to see there's a huge difference between North and South Korea, even though there's the same culture, but this begs the question why? So you have to go deeper, and deep meaning deeper is this. It's what I call, uh, you have to go to institutional systems and the changes of them, and the institutional variables which are most important from the point of view of uh, economic growth are property rights, both the type and the level of protection. These are variables, market competition, we have many capitalistic economies without competition, and they cannot grow very fast. Then flexibility of markets, and also the fiscal burden of the state, which of course depends on the level of expenditures. And when we speak about expenditures, we have, have to focus on the largest item, which is social or welfare expenditures. Now, but uh, the growth literature usually disregards the second factor, which is very important and namely magnitude and frequency of negative shocks. From the point of view of a given country, the shocks may come from outside, and we call them external, but most shocks are produced by wrong policies, and they are domestic. Usually economists, especially in the West, tend to blame markets for shocks, but they overlook the simple facts that the huge, the largest, most negative, deepest shocks were produced 
by non-controlled, unlimited governments. Look at Stalin. Look at Mao. So it is a concentration of political power, which leads to catastrophic policies, which produce huge shocks. And this is completely disregarded in literature on growth. <laughs> and uh, what is called external shocks to small countries is a domestic shock produced by a large government, a government of a large country, which is US. Why we have you called the recent crisis global? Because it was produced by wrong policies in the only globally important countries, which is the US. Small countries cannot produce large externalities. <laughs> Only large countries produce large externalities, including negative. So what is going on in the US is doubly important for the US and for the outside world, of course. Now, to sum up the experience of empirically oriented literature on growth, who has, what countries have been growing very slowly or stagnated? Those who suffered frequent and powerful shocks, and this is experience of most of Africa until recently, and all countries which have maintained anti-productive, anti-innovative systems, which are various uh, combination of statism and the lack of competition. And this has been shown empirically. Who has been able to grow fast over the long run? Countries which have avoided huge frequent shocks, and countries which have maintained uh, a regime uh, which was friendly enough for private investment and innovation, or make a successful transition, like Central and Eastern Europe, some of Central and Eastern Europe. Most, most countries have to make transition because there are powerful forces operating in every country which aim at distorting the system. So then you need reforms. Like in Britain, why Mrs. Thatcher was necessary? Because before her, there were lots of anti-growth measures. You know, increasing uh, and the unproductive role of the public sector. Now, I give you one illustration. <clears throat> this is from the book I just finished. This is a comparison of some 15 pairs of countries which have one feature. At some point in time, they had the same per capita income, but then they diverged. And we investigated the group of my younger colleagues, what were the reasons. There are various reasons, but in many comparisons, a very important reason were shocks. So countries which slow down have suffered more shocks, which are domestically produced. And this is one example is Spain in Mexico. As you can see, 1960, the, these two countries were the same per capita income. But now Mexico is much poorer. Why? The mo most important reason was we found out that Mexico has suffered three powerful negative shocks produced by bad policies of Mexican governments. And until recently, Spain has not avoided that. So if I come to Poland, then I would say the fact that Poland managed to catch up the most among, among the former socialist countries are due to two facts. First, that we have reformed but we are not the leader in reforms. The Baltics are the leader. But second, that we have avoided so far powerful negative shocks. This is the decisive fact, including avoiding recession uh, during the recent slowdown. In so this brings me to a very brief description of what has been happening in Europe. I am coming closer to a topic everybody waits for. It is whether Eurozone will survive till tomorrow. <laughs> According to a CNN, it is not very sure. <laughs> they, or every day they put a big question mark, well, depending on what Germany is going to do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, now very briefly, you, the main point which emerges is a great variety of policies in Europe. So there is no one Europe in the policy sense. So to generalize about Europe is a bit risky, and I will try to show you. Uh, sorry for these many figures. I skip that. But fiscal. Now, on fiscal, you saw a great di diversity in a sense that there have been countries which have reduced. You should have to compare. If you look to what has happened during the boom, you would have to look at the f com compare 2007 with, say, 2000. And you see that some countries 
have reduced the budget deficit during that period, while other countries have extended it. And look at Greece. Where is Greece? I can, can you see Greece? Well, I will read it to you. In Greece, the budget deficit in 2007 was 105, so very, very high. And it increased by several percentage points. Italy has maintained a budget deficit over, over 100%. And uh, in Portugal, uh, there was a surge in budget deficit as a ratio of GDP from 68 to 48, but not in Spain. Spain has suffered from another uh, problem, uh, credit boom, private credit boom. But at the same time, Sweden has reduced the budget deficit to GDP from 54 to 40. The same goes even more for Denmark. And there's a mixed story in uh, emerging Europe. So the diversity, diversity. The problem was, as you can see, that large countries like France, Italy, even Germany, have increased the budget deficit. So they were not showing uh, fiscal discipline. Now, this is another story because you may have two problems on the demand side. Usually, the economists complain about not sufficient demand. But the main problem is excessive demand, domestic demand. Because if you have not sufficient demand, it's mostly due to excessive demand before. Which means if you, you have bust, because you have booms before. And booms are two kinds. First, fiscal. So governments are borrowing to finance spending. And they incur growing public debt. This is the story in Europe of Greece, Portugal, Britain. And the second problem on the, de uh, uh, on the demand side, in the form of the excessive demand, is a private credit boom, usually housing. And in Europe, this was a question of the US. But in Europe, Ireland, Spain, Ukraine, the Baltics, Bulgaria. And then the question is why? And we have to come to policies. There's something to do with interest rates. If interest rates are too low, then credit grows too fast. And the first people are very happy, and then turn out to be unhappy. Boom goes into the bust. So uh, countries which have suffered the most problems have uh, experienced combination of two booms, or one of them, either fiscal boom and or credit boom. And this sh is shown by this uh, table which shows that, uh, let me point, if you look and, but you do not need to grow, you do not need to have a credit boom to grow. You can grow without a credit boom. That's a story of Germany. In Germany, the ratio of credit, private credit to GDP was lower in 2008 than in the year 2000. There's the story of Czech Republic. But if you look at Spain, the ratio has doubled from 98 to almost 200. So very rapid growth of private credit. If you look at Ireland, the same story. And the same goes for uh, in the emerging Europe, um, Bulgaria, Lithuania. They have experienced ex extreme credit boom. While Czech Republic has maintained a discipline. Uh, to Poland too. So the differences in the intensity of credit boom had a very important impact upon what happened next and what happened next. Uh, but let me finish the story. When much of the credit boom, either fiscal or private credit, was financed from abroad. And this has been shown in the widening current account deficits. But you have, again, that diversity. You have an explosion of budget deficit in Greece between 2007 and 2000, but from minus almost 8 to almost minus 15, to some extent in Ireland. In Portugal, it has been maintained at a very high level of 10%. In Spain, it more than doubled. But such countries like Austria, Finland, Germany. Germany has uh, improved, tremendously improved uh, uh, the current account balance. So diverse, very diverse. In emerging Europe, countries which have uh, credit booms, 
have also widened, tremendously widened the current account deficits, the Baltics and Bulgaria, because this was financed by inflows of capital from abroad. While again, the Czech Republic and Poland have maintained discipline. So the growth of power current account deficit was much slower because the credit boom was much slower. And finally, an important indicator to finish is unit labor cost. If your spending is growing very fast, it means that wages are growing very fast and they overtake productivity growth. And this is the story of countries which have credit booms, fiscal and or credit. Look at Greece. Here we have, we, I take 2003 as the base, 100. So look at Greece. The increase of uh, uni labor cost by more than 20%. I disregard Luxembourg, that's a very strange animal. Uh, but UK, again. And in, uh, in emerging Europe, you have again the Baltics, Bulgaria, but in Czech Republic and Poland, unit labor costs have declined, meaning that productivity is growing faster than wages. So competitiveness, price competitiveness was increasing. So diverse story. Okay, now when the global crisis has started, it was not purely imported. Europeans with certain schadenfreunde, you know, you know this nice German expression, schadenfreunde. Well, at the beginning they were saying, look, it is the US, but not us. The US is hurting us. <laughs> but it turned out that uh, this external shock was magnifying some domestic shocks in some European countries, those who suffered credit booms, fiscal. It has come with certain delay in Greece, but earlier it was revealed in Britain, Ireland. Uh, it was revealed uh, in Spain, Portugal. And it was revealed uh, uh, in the GDP, because when you have a credit boom, so first credit is growing too fast, spending is growing too fast, and then you have a decline, unavoidably. You can do very little to avoid it, and if you do it, you pay the price in the longer run. So you see what is striking if you compare Central and Eastern Euro uh, developed economies, that again, that diversity, I'm not going into details, but let me summarize the diversity. So in the a developed Europe, uh, I have taken 2008, 2009 together. You see that Greece, Ireland, Italy have suffered the most. In, and these are countries which have credit booms, of, uh, spending booms. But in Central and Eastern Europe, you have the Baltics, extreme declines. Like Latvia, in one year, almost 20% GDP decline. In two years, more than 10. Lithuania, uh, Estonia, Bulgaria. Ukraine also. Ukraine, uh, Ukraine developed an extreme credit boom before 2008. But uh, Poland has a, has a slowdown, but not a recession. And I am very happy to get a question why. Uh, we have to respond. <laughs> but I leave it aside for the moment and we go. Now, when you look at some other indicators, then you see that countries which have suffered the credit booms have widened the credit, uh, budget deficit very much during the slowdown. And what is striking is that three countries which have now problems, Greece, Portugal, Spain, have engaged in extremely aggressive fiscal stimulus in 2008, 2009. And I'm afraid they were encouraged by the IMF because fiscal stimulus was in the mode, was very fashionable without consequences, extremely. And another striking observation is that the degree of fiscal stimulus was not related to the, the death of the recession, meaning that some countries which, uh, have very little stimulus and other countries have an extremely large stimulus with the same recession. It's a very interesting to compare, say, Britain and Germany. The same slowdown, Britain has engaged in an aggressive fiscal stimulus. I remember Gordon Brown was praised as a world leader 
in this stimulating economy. <laughs> they are now struggling with fiscal problems. While Germany was much less, more disciplined. So engaged much, much less in fiscal stimulus. Okay, now let me skip this, what has happened. Let me only summarize this part of my short introduction in saying that, uh, and re uh, repeating that countries which have engaged in aggressive uh, booms, which have experienced booms, uh, suffer more problems than countries which have less spending booms, either fiscal or, or, uh, or private credit booms. And one, two observations on unemployment. There is no relation, unemployment has surged everywhere. But the increase in unemployment is not related to the recession. So you have, you have the same recession in 2008-2009 in uh, Britain and Spain. But an in, the increase in unemployment in Spain is twice as high as in Britain. So other factors matter. And these other factors include flexibility of labor markets. You have rigid American market. If you cannot reduce wages, then the reaction of the economy to the negative shock, demand shock, is dismissing people. And on inflation, what is striking, at least to me, a former and old-fashioned central banker, is that even be, despite a pretty strong slowdown, there was no deflation. No deflation in the US. There's a lot of talk of deflation in the US. I think it's a deflation scare in the US. But no deflation, that's the first point. The second point is that it appears that the surge in inflation is more than the surge in GDP. When there is a recovery, in other words, the recovery in inflation is stronger than the recovery in GDP. And this is very visible in the world leader in the quantitative easing, which is not the US, but Britain. In, the, in Britain, you have very low interest rates, huge quantitative easing, which simply means central bank is printing money. And inflation in Britain has exceeded 5%. This is another very interesting story, what would be the consequences of a great monetary experiment of uh, stimulated by Fed and some other central banks, but I leave it to uh, debate. Okay. Uh, now, one interesting indicator is the reaction of financial markets to the fiscal crisis, and you see a divergence in the in developed Europe. Countries which have maintained reasonable fiscal discipline enjoy low interest rates. Countries which have engaged in fiscal or credit booms and or have displayed le uh, lack of fiscal discipline like Greece or Portugal or to some extent Italy have their interest rates going up. Which means that financial markets may be short-sighted but they are not completely stupid. And they distinguish between countries and corporations. Very imperfectly but probably better than the governments. And here, what is striking, I'm going to come to that. In Central and Eastern Europe, the tendency is for interest rates to go down. Now, let me come to the last point. <laughs> so you see the divergence in uh, Europe, including uh, developed Europe. And here are some problems, which I think uh, it's in, are important in discussing question of the Eurozone. Macroeconomic developments I've mentioned before. So the divergence in the reason of discipline, let me repeat, in Finland, Austria, Netherlands, Germany. On the one hand, lack of discipline in Greece, Portugal, in spending discipline. Spain, inter intermediate regions, or perhaps Italy would be belonged more to the second and the first group. But let me uh, discuss, this is a mention of institutional developments. It's a long story which is cut short. So, First, you might remember that the final decision to start the Eurozone was started late 90s, and there was an original sin which was committed. 
countries which did not qualify were admitted for political reasons, meaning that countries which have widely surpassed that ceiling of 60% were admitted, Italy, Greece, and Belgium. By the way, Belgium is doing better than Italy. <laughs> and this was the first problem. The second problem, a very important part of the Euro package called Stability and Growth Pact, which was international treaty signed by every country. And this international treaty prohibited budgets which would bring a budget deficit about 3%. Budget were expected to be in balance over the longer run. And public debt was expected not to exceed 60%. This was an international obligation. What has happened? Well, divergence. Some countries have stuck to it, like Austria, Finland, etc. Some have violated it. But the real problem was that France and Germany have violated it. So, and then what they did, they changed the rules of the club. <laughs> they modified it, which meant that the rules remained on paper. Uh, it is over overlooked, and this is number three, that ECB, European Central Bank, was sort of subsidizing weaker countries because it was charging them the same interest rates for liquidity operations. It did not distinguish between credit risk of various countries. And of course, it continues now on the massive scale. OK. Now, problems have, but the first 10 years of Euro were very successful. It was regarded as successful because these were good times. And let me praise Marty Feldstein who warned before Euro was launched that the real test for Euro would be difficult times. And we have now difficult times. <laughs> so these difficult times were started in the public by a revelation, what is the true Greece budget deficit? It was supposed to not to exceed, I think, 4%. It was more than 10, 2009. And some people, insiders say everybody knew it was the fact. And then it started a debate in, Euro, in, the Europe, in the Eurozone what to do. And this debate lasted for four months. And I remember that the, and the debate was whether the IMF should be admitted to assist, which even at that time seemed to be absurd. Because it was no problem when IMF was assisting uh, 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 Hungary or Latvia, but to assist the if IMF was assisting uh, Greece, some people said it would be un-European. Very strange explanation, not European. This is the European problem, it should be European solution, so they're waiting for months. And finally, under pressure of circumstances, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, May last year, there was a package, first uh, IMF was admitted, allowed to assist, then there was a creation of extra provisional ex sort of European IMF, a vehicle, financial vehicle, which now has $440 billion to extend to offer conditional crisis lending. And now the discussion is to expand this. Then uh, in turn out, this assistance was turned out to Ireland to uh, offer to um, forced. Oh, these countries were induced to accept Ireland and Portugal. And then in this year, we have discussions about modifications on the bail bailouts, including today's discussions. I don't know, and the focus is on the bailout, on the bailing out potential, which brings me to more fundamental problems, I think. Now, if you have a crisis, say fiscal crisis, economic crisis, there are two kinds of operations. The first crack type is usually called crisis management. By definition, it includes measures aiming at reducing the magnitude of the crisis. They do not always reach their goal. You should not confuse declarations with true effects. For example, not every fiscal stimulus improves the situation. <laughs> Even though fiscal stimulus is regarded as the most important manifestation 
of uh, crisis management. So crisis and uh, um, crisis management, I would I would divide it into two kinds of operations. Now is crisis lending. So we extend crisis markets do not offer loans or credits at sufficiently low interest rates. So you have official lenders. One is IMF, another one would be in the European Union, or you create special lenders. You, it is usually called bailed out. It is not transfers because these are not grants. Expectation is that these crisis loans would be repaid. And the true problem would begin in Europe if the crisis loans would not be repaid. Until now, there are loans or guarantees. And you, it's easy to notice that focus is on that. How big will be the bailout fund? It's like firefighting. Do we have enough firefighting potential? But there's a second question. What about cutting off the gasoline? Why financial markets are so worried? <laughs> That's a credibility problem. They are worried that what they uh, uh, lent would not be repaid. So the second kind of crisis management is to introduce measures which would restore the confidence in the markets. But words are not enough. Actions. And this is why Berlusconi is so pressed by other sinners, including Sarkozy, a lesser sinner, uh, 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 and also Germany, to do something. Have you noticed this in the media? Berlusconi must do reforms. Why? To restore the confidence of the markets. So two types of crisis management. And then you have crisis prevention, meaning measures which would reduce the risk of a very serious crisis. And this includes various reforms, which I am coming to discuss a bit later very briefly. And uh, to some extent, this adjustment on the 1.2 and crisis prevention overlap. For example, if you want to reduce the perception of risks in the financial markets, you should introduce reforms which would uh, strengthen the supply side without hurting the demand side. So demand is not falling, supply is strengthening. What is the crucial measure here? Rising retirement age. Because you increase labor supply without hurting spending. So all countries under pressure, all European countries under pressure are doing what is uh, long overdue. Rising retirement. In the US you have the same. But uh, it goes without government decrees. People who have funded systems, pension system, found out that they have much less money than they expected. So what they are doing, they are keeping on working. So it is automatic adjustment <laughs> of retirement age. <laughs> okay. Now, let me, I think that there's too much focus on crisis lending, which is understandable because you see this pressure and not, too, and not enough focus on adjustment which would restore the confidence of the markets and would strengthen longer economic growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. While the ultimate solution is not in crisis lending, it might be indispensable under some situation if you have a delay, so you have to do something. But the ultimate solution is on restoring confidence of markets and economic growth via, via appropriate measures which would uh, have to include retirement uh, age. And by the way, no amount of crisis lending can save Italy. Because Italy is the third largest, uh, the Italy's public that is the third largest in the world. After, uh, after of course, United States and Japan. But let me, why this is, uh, uh, discussing Italy is that it's, the stress is on the banks. Have you noticed banks? What is going to happen to banks who own Italian bonds? As though banks were only the only creditors, but it's not the case. Banks are not the most important creditors of uh, Italian debt or the Greek debt. Other institutions are more important. Pension funds. 
or individual uh, citizens. But somehow it's not much worry about them. <laughs> the worries about the banks, to some extent, because it is, uh, we, it is believed it is, uh, that banks are special. Banks are spe to some extent they are special, but because perhaps they are not so special. OK, now. Now, one should, dis in discussing uh, problems of the Eurozone and going beyond uh, the current firefighting, a bit deeper, I should distinguish between two kinds. Problems which exist in the Eurozone but not, are not caused by the Eurozone, are not due to the Eurozone. In other words, they would be present without Eurozone. For example, the fact that the largest European banks, especially the French ones, have little capital in relation to assets. It's a complication, it's a problem of the, in the Eurozone, but it is not caused by the Eurozone. You see the difference, yes? And second, there may be certain problems which exist in the Eurozone and are caused by the Eurozone, uh, related to the essence of the Eurozone. And uh, what are these problems, if there are any problems? And I am coming to the conventional interpretations, what I consider to be conventional interpretations, which does not mean they are not true. Maybe true, may not true. You certainly have noticed that. Those who maintain that there are certain fundamental problems of the Eurozone say first that one monetary policy cannot fit all. So if you have many countries, you should have many different monetary policies. And second, conventional interpretation is that Eurozone is a, an experiment, which means it's very risky, because it is a currency union accord without a political union. And I found this interpretation wanting. First, I am not saying they are complete, there's no grain of truth but they are exaggerated. On the first, I'm going, on the first, the main argument for those who say if you have, every country should have a separate currency. Uh, the main argument is that you, in case of problems, you have to have to be able to devalue your currency, to depreciate. So basically they are saying you have to have flexible rate of exchange. But there's a huge debate about uh, the virtue of fixed versus flexible rate of exchange, including very hard packs. And you cannot say, on the basis of empirical literature, that hard packs are always worse. And there are some success stories. Which countries are success, success, success stories in the Eurozone, beyond Germany? Those countries which have had hard pack to Deutsche Mark, Austria, Netherlands, etc. There are an experience of hard packs in the past, which are called currency bolts. And I am going to show you the adjustment without devaluation, comparing what I call B, it's intriguing name, it means Bulgaria, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, and PIX. PIX is much better known, which is Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece and what is, uh, and as is Spain. But the second cliche is that you need, uh, that currency union without a political union is risky or unsustainable. And here the basic problem is that both crucial terms are, are not clear. What is currency union and what is political union? In the strictest interpretation, currency union is taken to mean a nominally different currency by name, you distinguish by name. So a dollar, a fund, a franc, etc. And in a conventional interpretation, political union means a state, a single state. And then people say, Eurozone is not like a United States, so Eurozone cannot survive. But is it true? Is it convincing? You may first let me notice that you may have states which cannot maintain a good money, Argentina. So to having a single state and single currency 
certain is not uh, having a single state is not a uh, sufficient conditions for having a good money. Yes? But is it necessary condition? Well, this depends in turn how you interpret a word currency, currency union. As I said, the conventional interpretation is you have different names. But there's an economic interpretation which includes other situations. And economic interpretation is a group of currency which are linked by hard packs. You cannot devalue. They maintain the same value with respect to each other. This is the one currency, in fact. And what is the experience? Well, not completely catastrophic. You have an experience of currency balls, I am coming to that, but you have experience of gold standard which lasted, this was hard, these were hard packs, and this lasted for over 50 years, and it was abolished not because of economic collapse, but because of political catastrophe, which was the First World War. So there are certain counterfactuals. And uh, I would maintain that it is a mistake to say that the only model for the Eurozone is the United States, and it's more reasonable to say a feasible model for the Eurozone is sort of hard pack area. And then to inquire what is necessary, what are the conditions for success, and whether these conditions for success are likely to be met in the Eurozone. If not, then you can say no, it can be, cannot be known. And finally, let me mention that if you think about the meaning of the expression political union from the point of view of currency union. What is relevant? Then you see two things. First, that uh, members of the political union, meaning regions, should have a limited fiscal sovereignty. They should, could, would not, should, they should not have a freedom to expand their fiscal uh, budget deficits. Otherwise, you have Argentina with the provinces. And to limit the fiscal sovereignty of the members of the Eurozone was one of the purposes of uh, growth and stability pact, but it was violated. But it was foreseen as a condition. Second point is that nowadays we think that a federal budget should have a large budget. Yes? So if you don't have a large federal budget, that you cannot be recognized as a one state. On that issue, I would say Europe is not going to have a large federal budget, common budget in the foreseeable future. The common budget of, the Euro, of Europe, European Union, is 1%. And it's unlikely that it would grow in the foreseeable future for the simple fact that in order to have a large common budget, you have to have enough common identity. And there is no European identity and you cannot decree European identity. It is a longer term process. You, uh, uh, and if you try to impose excessive transfers across regions or countries, you risk political backlash, even within a single country. Look what has happened between North and South Italy. So there, were, there are constant transfers from the North to the South, as a result, you have a party in the north, Liga Norte, which, uh, which requires, demands separation. What has happened between West and East Germany? Vesis and Osis. So one has to be very careful. But a more important point is that I don't think a large common budget is necessary to maintain the Eurozone because the lack of such a budget was not a reason for the present crisis. The reason for the present crisis was a lack of discipline. So I would maintain that uh, one should rather look at the conditions of proper functioning of currency union with separate states and see what are these conditions, whether they can be fulfilled. And I will end by, this is taken from my, one of my recent publications, what would be these conditions. But first let me show a crucial contrast between adjustment in BLE and PICS. Uh, first of all, let me, this is much better. As you can see, 
Ireland should be added. I didn't have data. Ireland has performed quite well. Unit labor costs have been reduced in Ireland. So Ireland is adjusting much better than Portugal or Greece. But if you look at uh, Central and Eastern Europe, these are countries which are almost in the Eurozone because they have Euro-based currency boards. So they cannot devalue. So they're adjusting much better than on average. Second, they have been much lower public debt. And they are they are not expanding public debt so much as Greece. Third, they are taming budget deficits in Central and Eastern Europe, and this is not the case in TIX. The same goes for the public spending, current account deficit. That's amazing. You have a, a very high budget deficit in Greece all the time, despite all the talk about adjustment. At the same time, you have unbelievable adjustment of current, uh, the, the budget deficit, current account deficit in the BE in the order of 20% of GDP. So why, uh, why I am showing this? To point out that there's a group of countries which adjusted successfully without nominal devaluation. They've been able to reduce spending very much, but they are going up. They are making a foul-shaped recovery. They were not assisted by ECB. They did not get liquidity assistance. Countries which get liquidity assistance, like Greece, have adjusted much less. And uh, I think the very important evidence of that is the fact that they maintain very high current account deficits. So they are not adjusting very much. There's a lot of talk about adjustment. Ireland is a different story. And now I come, if you agree that, accept that a proper model for the Eurozone is a group of countries which cannot devalue with respect to each other, which resembles gold, gold standard, not with every detail to be sure, in that crucial dimension, then you have to define what would be the most important reforms necessary to, make, to maintain the Eurozone. And I think there are three kind of measures. First of all, to avoid procyclicality. That's the economic jargon. Boom and bust. Reduce that. Second, strengthen long-term economic growth. That matters for countries which have large debt to GDP. And third, flexibility of the economy, especially of the labor markets. And each of these points can be developed. I, am, I can come to that later, if you like me to. And some of these points have been long mentioned. That's nothing new. The point that's not, not revolutionary <laughs> as far as uh, pointing out what has to be implemented. Okay. So I would say Europe has a future. Euro, Euro, that's my final conclusion. <laughs> Europe will survive. Uh, first, second, uh, I think that uh, poorer Europe will continue to catch up, which means uh, doing more reforms than Western Europe. And you can prove that more reforms means more growth in the long run. That's a very strong empirical evidence, I think. Third, I do not, uh, I, I don't think it's enough, enough evidence to say that uh, Eurozone is doomed to collapse. I think he can survive if proper reforms are implemented. And one good thing out of this, out of bad thing, which is the crisis, is that reforms which were unheard of in Greece or in Portugal or in Spain are being implemented because of the pressure of the markets. The pressure of the markets is much stronger than the peer pressure of other politicians. Thank you very much. So we'll have uh, now time for questions. If you would uh, come to the microphone and uh, identify yourself briefly and pose the question, be brief so others have a chance as well. Thank you. My name is, my name is Peter, and uh, I'm actually from Poland. And I grew up in. Uh, <clears throat> I was born in 1976, so I remember the 
the, the time of the reforms, uh, um, 1989, I was 13, so I don't remember exactly everything, but, but it, was, uh, it was amazing how, uh, just com after coming to US, you know, it was amazing how, how quickly Poland, um, or how much of an example to other countries Poland was after the, the, the reforms that were uh, initiated by, by Leszy Bartowicz, so thank you for that, and thank you for the wonderful presentation. My question was, um, and also, also thank you for inviting um, um, my question was, uh, what role do, do the market uh, structure uh, play in, in that? Because you know, this is focusing a lot on, on fiscal, um, um, fiscal um, ar arithmetic, but, but uh, you know, one of the things we heard from Greece, you know, they said, you know, we're never going to be Germany. We, we, we are an uh, agricultural slash uh, tourism um, country, and so you know, what, what's, what's going to be the engine that's going to drive our, um, you know, our economy, and you know, how, do we, how do we do that? So, if you could quickly address, you know, the distribution of uh, of, of market sectors in in, in in all the countries and, and how that does does that play in um, 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 in you know reviving the, the economies of, of countries that are currently in crisis. Well, structure depends <clears throat> on the economic conditions, <clears throat> and uh, there has been a tremendous change in structure under market reforms. You would never uh, have achieved this beneficial change in structure under the central planning. So top-down structural policies are usually wrong. So if you ask me about what happens to the structure, I would have to say it depends on what happens to the system and policies. You mentioned Greece. Let me say in Poland. In the Polish exports, you have such a variety. <laughs> you, no central planner would ever devise. It's beyond the capacity sort of saying. We are exporting buses and exporting uh, components. And the same goes, of course, for other reformed Central European uh, countries. So it is the private investment and innovation under competition, which creates structural change. And if you want to have a structural change, so remove obstacles to private investment, innovation, and competition. And competition is necessary for innovations. Now, what is striking in Greece when you look at the data, there is a small country which is closed. This you measure this by the ratio of export and import to GDP. It's very low, and much lower than in Czech Republic, much lower than in Central and Eastern Europe, even lower than Poland, and Poland is much larger. So which means that uh, they have been maintaining obstacles to competition. But normally imports would be growing. So somehow, so when they remove this, they are going to grow because Greeks are very successful entrepreneurs. It is not a Greek mentality <laughs> which has caused these problems. If you look at the evolution of the Greek economy, you see that 30 years ago they were very successful. There was much less public sector and state intervention, but something has happened to the political system. Uh, there was an expansion of the public sector, an expansion of trade unions within both political parties. And they, of course, pushed for the exp further expansion of the public sector. And in Greece, under this change, things which are completely normal in Central and Eastern Europe, for example, that you can have private universities, were banned. And a couple of years ago, when there was a proposal to allow private schools to be set up, there were riots in Greece. They have very aggressive militant organizations. And if you read what Greeks themselves are saying, you can understand. So it is not mentality, it is certain political change which have accentuated uh, the uh, political role and indirectly econom economic role of militant organ anti-capitalistic organizations. But they can be successful. And one more point. There is a certain perhaps paradox. If a country accumulates many distortions, then there is more room for reforms, which would strengthen growth. If a country is already perfectly reformed, you don't have a room for reforms. <laughs> so, of course, it was a price which was paid in the past because of these distortions. You are much poorer. But you can grow faster if you introduce reforms which abolish distortions. And this is a chance for Greece. Uh, hi, Dan Daniel Halberstam from the law school. Um, since the line isn't long, maybe I could ask two questions. Um, 
the first is about the government policies that you suggested um, lay at the heart of um, all of these problems. Um, and I wondered whether th th there seemed to be sort of a, a deregulatory sense in, um, in, in your accusation that it's government policies of spending, of regulation, we need flexible labor markets, et cetera. And so I was wondering, um, uh, when you talked about U.S. government policies that had triggered this, of course, some of them were Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, giving out free credit and things like that. But there were also deregulatory, deregulatory policies in the United States that at least some people in the U.S. think are responsible for not making the market um, attuned to uh, the, 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 uh, the impending problem. Um, uh, similarly, if you compare, say, Germany to the U.K. in terms of the response after the crisis, Germany in some ways, Germany's response was in part uh, more heavily governmentally involved in a certain sense uh, through the back door, through welfare uh, legislation, through social security provisions, and through slowing down labor and forcing that as opposed to allowing layoffs. And so you might say there was a more heavily, heavy in involvement um, of the German government, uh, plus Germany benefited from the, from the low euro as an export country. So um, I sort of wonder about the, about the UK-Germany uh, um, comparison there. So I guess the first question is, are there also deregulatory policies that are uh, bad and um, at the root of this? The second question is about, the, um, uh, about whether we need a political union. Um, I'm quite happy to hear that we don't need a political union in order for this all to work, because I'm quite happy for it all to work. Um, but I do have a question about the, the studies and also something that, that you said yourself. You said at uh, um, international law or a treaty obligation will never work as strong as the markets work. Um, and similarly, if you look at studies comparing Argentina and Germany, as you, I'm sure you well know, um, the argument is that you need an integrated political system so that local politicians are integrated with central politicians and so that local politicians will be disciplined because they aspire to central office. And that this is sort of a, a political economy story about integration, creating some sense of a, a market for politics that is, uh, that is union wide. Um, and that without that, uh, you will never get the local politicians to have the discipline um, to actually take the interests of the entire system into account. So you can, so the short, short line would be, you can write growth and stability pacts all you like if local politicians will never feel that, they're, that they have national or central aspirations and that they are integrated with a central political structure. Those growth and stability pacts will never work. Um, I would be happy for them to work, um, but so I just wanted to ask that as, as a question. Let me start with the third. I agree with you. I am not saying that growth and stability pack, a top-down approach is sufficient. <clears throat> it may be desirable to increase pressure upon the local governments, but ultimately, whether you preserve fiscal discipline or not, it's up to the local population. And there is a tendency in every society, modern society, it was not the feature of the 19th century to expand fiscally for various reasons. And when you say expand fiscally, it's not a military spending. It is uh, social spending. Military spending in the US accounts for 5%. Social spending accounts, what we call it welfare spending, for 25 or some more per percent. So complete in every country you have, it is the welfare social spending which uh, the expansion of which creates, if there's an expansion, creates fiscal crisis. Now, uh, so if you want to limit the state expansion, fiscal expansion, you need constraints. And there are two kinds of constraints. <clears throat> the, at the approximate level, you need fiscal constitutions. To, to, like, const what is the most important part of the constitution, including the American ones, to limit the government, not to promise too much. So you need fiscal constraints. In Poland, which I know the best, the best part of Polish constitution is that the public debt cannot exceed 60% of GDP. And you have some other countries. Germany has recently introduced a fiscal constraint on their current fiscal policy. But it's not enough, because you may have introduced, you may introduce constitutional constraints, but you may then eliminate it. So you need a constant vigilance of people who believe in limited government, who limit in individual responsibility and freedom. And this requires a constant effort. You have to organize it. It is easy to organize uh, groups which demand more from the, it's very easy. 
And it's very emotional because you can always justify it by helping poor, the poor and the weak, et cetera, et cetera. It's very much more difficult to organize groups which would aim at limiting the state expansion. And the ultimate success of economic growth depends on that. The same goes for regulation. But there is always a talk of excessive regulation. Because you have a legislative process which produces constant regulation. Why? Because it's not enough monitoring. But the state cannot monitor itself. So it needs an external monitor, which is called civil society, an appropriate side, part of civil society. It needs to be strengthened in every country. I'm trying to do it in, the, in Poland. So in Greece, uh, and now there's a, a recognition in European Union that fiscal constraints of constitutional nature are necessary. And I think it's correct. On your first point, no, I try to follow empirical literature so financial crisis, not only the recent crisis. And I found a lot of empirical support for the statement it was uh, excessively low interest rates established by Fed, that there were political pressure, your housing policy, but I haven't found empirical support for the popular statement that it was a deregulation. For example, if you... Uh, let us imagine that you have maintained the separation of investment banking, etc., and commercial banking. You would have the same, very similar effects. So it's popular, but not convincing empirically. This is in response to your... And you may find countries which have completely deregulated, including Europe, but have not suffered financial crisis. You have completely deregulated in Poland. In the Czech Republic, they have completely deregulated the financial. In the sense, it's open to competition. You have no controls of interest rate, no entry, and there is no financial crisis. So not deregulation, if you want to be empirically based. Now, on the third, I, if I understand you probably, you, wanted, you, uh, you focus on my comparison between uh, what, Germany and, uh, and, you know, and Britain, yes? Well, what I said is that Britain has introduced much more massive fiscal stimulus in 2008 and 2009 than Germany. And that it appears that this has contributed to fiscal problems of Britain, but that not United States, uh, not Germany, sorry, not Germany. So this is the empirical statement, and you can give arguments for that. On the fiscal front, I just have the data, and I walk, uh, walk looking at the data. So if you compare spending to GDP, now this is the public debt, but domestic credit, just let me see. Public spending, what you see? You see that uh, in UK, you have a visible expansion as measured by public debt uh, to, to, to GDP. In Germany, you have a certain reduction, but certainly this, this is not the only factor which shapes economic performance. You have, uh, in Germany, what was very important, uh, according to empirical research, was that they have dismantled the bargain, wage bargaining system. They have very bad bar wage bargaining system, which was sector-based. So it produces excessive wage pressures, which was then uh, spread. And they have reformed that under Schroeder, by the way, not under uh, center right, by center, what is called center left. And they went through a period of a slow growth of spending, including wages, which strengthened their competitiveness. Why countries like Greece have engaged in excessive spending? So I don't understand people who blame Germany. There are some people who, if Germany bought more, then Greece would not be in problems. It's a very strange logic. One should not blame countries which adjusted. They adjusted, uh, they, are, they avoided the gravest problems. They still have a substantial public debt to GDP, but as distinct from some other countries, they pay attention to that. They do not disregard this as a problem. Um, my name is Bartek Voda. I'm a graduate student in the Econ Department. Um, and um, my question is about, um, so you said that, um, using Greece as, as an example, you said that uh, it's not enough to just borrow a bunch of money uh, to deal with the crisis. It's important to have 
uh, reforms that will restore market confidence uh, in Greece. Uh, but Greece has done some of that. I mean, they actually implemented truly draconian measures, um, you know, including cutting the minimum wage by, I think, like a third or something like that, uh, introducing massive cuts to the public sector, et cetera. And uh, it just doesn't seem to be really making a, a change, at least not yet. Uh, so my question is, what, what more can they do to deal with the, with the crisis right now? I mean, should they just have, you know, uh, the German finance minister come in and, you know, take over their, their finances? Because, I mean, it doesn't really seem to be, um, whatever they're doing, they're not really, um, see, they, they don't seem to be successful so far. So, yeah, so what, what more can they do? That's my question. First, if it was draconian or not, it's not enough to read what the newspapers say and listen to the media and see these demonstrators that they say it's draconian. You have to look at data. And I think the, one of the best indicators, what is draconian or not, it's uh, what is happening to current account deficit. Are the finance for abroad or not? And there's a very little adjustment. Let me see, Greece. 2000, they had, well, there is adjustment, but there is not draconian. They had, in 2007, a, they had minus 14.7. Now they have 10, minus 10.5. If you compare this with really draconian adjustment in Central and Eastern Europe, then you see the difference. I have shown in uh, Bulgaria and the Baltics the adjustment. Here it's an adjustment of less than five percentage points of GDP. In, uh, uh, in the BLE, adjustment is in the range of 20 percent of GDP. So you should not confuse talk with the facts. And remember when you base your judgment on those who protest, you are uh, you class in the streets. You see, on you don't see those who do not protest. So you are fallen to an acoustic bias, a victim to an acoustic or with a bias. Uh, so it's very dangerous to generalize. It's it's a biased bias selection. Yes. So, and I recently listened to a talk given by the Greek foreign minister, and uh, I asked him what about the Greek population, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I hope he was not diplomatic in saying that there is a silent majority for adjustment, that people realize that their system was rotten, that uh, they borrowed the future from the future, and now the, the day of reckoning has come. The problem uh, of a political nature would be more that perhaps there's not enough ownership of the program. They may think it is being imposed by these awful guys from IMF and European Commission and Germany. <laughs> that's maybe, that's maybe, and what complicates things is, you know, there was an election campaign, what, 2009. There were two parties campaigning. The governing party, who was also not very good at policies, but was saying we cannot afford more spending, social spending. PASOK, who governs, was saying we can afford more. So they were promising Greeks more of the same, and they won elections. <laughs> and then they revealed that the budget deficit is not 4% by 10%, and they have to make a complete U-turn. So I guess this may a bit undermine their credibility. But perhaps it is a Nixon effect. You know? It takes socialists to undermine to eliminate socialist policies, perhaps. Uh, I live in Bulgaria and I have for the past 17 years or so, and uh, you've praised it for uh, getting its uh, deficits under control, uh, but I can say from personal experience that that has come at a very high price. Um, in my wife's hometown, uh, the municipal government has its phone lines cut because it can't pay the bill. On my street, there are no fewer than four potholes that I can fit my minivan into. Uh, the old people are getting by on a pension of less than $100 a month. And the childcare system where I was working as a member of an NGO is woefully inadequate. Uh, sure. Do you believe that there is a space for transition into a freer market and austerity that doesn't involve that level of pain on people who are essentially helpless? Uh, what you are basically saying is how awful is the therapy? <clears throat> But you are not comparing this with the effects on not treating the patient. I remember the same from Poland. 
in the early 80s. They could say, well, there are tremendous social costs of reforms. They are basically saying the same. But they did not compare these costs with the cost of non-reforms. It's like you have a patient which suffers from tuberculosis, and you say, well, the treatment is awful, it's bad, etc. Can you cure him without penicillin? I would say no. So I think uh, it's a bias not to compare the costs. And here, it's quite clear. Who would give you money? Where would you get the money from? Well, that's a good question. Well, well I think I that's agree. a fundamental question. Whenever you hear there are such a costs, there are costs. I'm not denying it. But you have to compare consequences of various strategies. And I know I was in Bulgaria. I'm pretty often. But you have, by the way, a very good minister of finance, Diankov, who was one of the top economists in the World Bank. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> he was very good. I think he's doing a very good job. But of course, if you have suffered a boom and then a bust, then you have to adjust. If you don't have a rich uncle, which is very risky to have rich uncles for a longer time, like Greece. I think my question was, is there a way to do this that doesn't involve pain being disproportionately borne by let's say, retirees and orphans, and more on... Well, I don't know enough of, uh, to, just to, to, to engage in more concrete uh, judgment about Bulgaria, but at the general level, you've made a very successful adjustment, first. Second, Bulgaria should be congratulated, because by, Bulgaria, as distinct from Greece, has, kept, has reduced the public debt. In 2000, the year 2000, the public debt to GDP was 70%. In 2007, it was 16%, a great achievement of successive governments. And you should compare yourself with Greece. We are neighboring. <laughs> this would strengthen uh, the mood, improve the mood in Bulgaria to some extent. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Balsarovic, I'd like to ask you, I'm sure you have read about our um, U.S. Tea Party and the latest um, on the left, the Wall Street Group. Could you comment on no. whether, <laughs> no? Whether, I'm joking. <laughs> let me just finish that question and then you can say no. I, I, <laughs> I wanted to say whether you feel that these groups uh, are effective at all in limiting government spending or if you have some other suggestions. Yeah. Well, I can't know because I haven't done the research. I only know, judging from what I have read, that one of the goals of what is called Tea Party Movement was to limit the government spending. At the same time, I understand they are not so enthusiastic about doing something about social security, but at least they stress this. So, and I can only say, I can only repeat that my reading of empirical literature is there are many countries which have suffered because of the lack of fiscal discipline. I have yet found no single country which would suffer because of excessive fiscal discipline. Can you find out one country which suffered in the longer term because fiscal discipline was excessive? Well, that's no. So you see there's a clear asymmetry. Fiscal discipline tends to be on the side of lacking discipline because of political factors. Then you need countermeasures. <laughs> That's it. Um, if you ask me about uh, you know, what is occupied Wall Street, I can only say as a witness. I was in San Francisco in the center. I was watching the various. Yeah, there's a great variety of demands, including the one which I found very interesting down with the Fed. Abolish the Fed. <laughs> which is like Ron Paul. <laughs> Abolish the Fed, Federal Reserve Board. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. What non-state civic institutions uh, do you consider to be good for stability, and how do you expect they would vary between states and between polities within those states? Uh, first, let me make sure that I understood your question. First, what institution do I consider to be crucial for? Uh, non-state civic institutions that would be essential for stability. Uh, I know you mentioned, and in fact, I share a skepticism for dependence on a central authority, but I am curious what you think would necessarily supplant that in civic life, other than Rotary Club. A civil society cannot society. be created by the state. So it has to come from the people. 
if you ask me about how to create civil society, there is no simple recipe. It takes people who believe in certain ideals. And that's very important moral motivation. You have to believe in the individual responsibility and freedom and that two go together. Mm -hmm. And then you have to be good at organization and communication. <laughs> and to, to gather people. Um, I, I think the best example is uh, the United States, uh, even though it, it still remains something to be done. And in countries which uh, suffered socialists, you start almost from zero. Not from zero, because certain organizations remain, like trade unions, and they are not pushing for limited state. So you have to be even to do even more on another side. Thank you. And then others, that, of course, if you have to be, you, know, you have to convey certain messages to the public opinion. And they are conditions. They have to be empirically based, beyond any proof, uh, reproof. So they have to be true. And second, you have to communicate them. And this is the this is the key challenge to communicate to broader public, which means you can't be boring. You have to be interesting. So I, I, it was mentioned, I, I created a think tank in Poland four years ago to try to influence the public opinion. What we are doing? We are using comicses. Yes, comicses in the schools. We are having uh, each year a competition for the best comics. Why inflation is bad, for example, et cetera, et cetera. I have, are getting hundreds of uh, projects, and then the best ones are publicized. So all kinds of devices to catch attention, because you compete for attention. Speaking of attention, uh, the good thing is that we actually have a reception right now to which oh. we are all invited, so that we can continue the discussion in a more informal setting. Let me uh, conclude this formal part by thanking the staff of the Weiser Center, the Ford School, the International Policy Center for setting all this up, and to our speaker for providing us with some food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.